This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics. We promise to do our best to keep it both insightful, but brief. In this episode, we have Alex Guerra, Head of Monetization at Baz Super App. Alex, welcome to the BSF House podcast. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a definitely a good opportunity to talk to you and your audience. Thank you. Great. Thank you for coming, Alex. Okay. Um, back in the day, when app developers made money selling copies of their apps, a growth strategy was important. Then an the purchaser came along. A necessity to retain app users by having a solid strategy became even more important. Today, when app subscriptions are the name of the game, it is absolutely crucial to have a robust growth strategy to build a profitable app business. Now, chances are you're listening to this episode as you are on your Uber ride. And so who else, if not a former member of Uber's marketing team, should be on this episode to talk about profitable growth strategy for subscription apps And so we've got Alex. But first, before anything else, Alex, please tell us about yourself. What is your background in mobile tech? Uh, Good question. So I've been at tech uh, for about uh, six, seven years now. Um, I did my master's actually in London and then decided to change my pathway towards tech. I think that was definitely one of the best decisions I've made. And then I joined Uber pretty much afterwards, uh, joining the marketplace operations, uh, pretty much also conducting uh, promotions, pricing changes. Like uh, I, 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 by that time, the, the pricing and promotions function was part of the finance team. So we decided to lay, to give a little bit more of like marketing and operation sense. Um, so that's how I got into Uber. But my background is in engineering, industrial engineering. Um, then I moved. Uh, pretty much to finance marketing, doing everything about like apps uh, for the, about the past four years or so. And then in this project that I'm working right now, building this the biggest super app in, in Latin America now focused on Mexico, uh, pretty much also doing the same, right? Pricing, revenue management, and particularly the revenue growth function, which is super important now these days, particularly with inflation and many other challenges that the economy is facing. Oh, yeah. Um, How was it after you joined Uber to actually using the product on a daily basis as a passenger? Was it uh, kind of a different feeling like you can actually take an Uber ride being part of the Uber team and see the product from the inside as a user than just being part of the team as the part of the team? Yeah, it definitely was. I remember that before joining the company back in the days, um, the first introduction of Uber in different markets was Uber Black, if you remember. Oh, yeah. uh, it was very mm-hmm. aspirational product. So it, it was super cool to go with your friends and then go to the bar, go to a club, go to any other place, uh, and then split fare. Uh, and then when Uber decided to go into the taxi market more like openly after Lyft started doing the same with peer-to-peer uh, ride hailing, mm-hmm. uh, then everything changed a little bit. And then when I joined the company, obviously understanding how complex the algorithms were behind, particularly dynamic pricing. And then a few years later, when Uber launched their Uber Pass and, and the Uber One, uh, moving on to the subscription world, it was definitely a great experience to learn and, and perhaps some of the things I can share with you guys today. All right, that's cool. Now, let's begin with laying out the landscape of challenges that app businesses have today. What are the major ones? Uh, I think... These days, I think it's super important, you already mentioned retention, and I will say also monetization. Uh, I've seen lots of apps that started with a very aggressive acquisition and somehow activation or retention strategy, um, but they are finding flows on their business models to monetize customers. And this is driven by design in some cases. It's also driven by, obviously, a market in which we have some actual liquidity still from some mm-hmm. of, uh, of, these, of these companies that raised money a few years ago uh, and some others are still doing, not necessarily with equity these days, but some of them are doing with debt. So, um, so I think it, it's on the design of this business model, uh, 
uh, but I'm seeing that these things are changing from uh, growth at all at all sake, uh, more approach, uh, and then letting in the past a little bit more like a growth uh, as much as money you have for for lodging incentives, aggressive acquisition campaigns, and so yeah. Right, and uh, pretty much like right now, the, we've seen these layoffs in Twitter and Facebook, uh, Pinterest, and that's this is just a very uh, hard moment for tech because it's really unusual. Like uh, we heard about recessions in other uh, parts of the economy, and this time it looks like it's really hitting the uh, high tech when we are kind of uh, getting back to semi normal after COVID. A lot of companies gotten hired so many people uh, to meet the demand. And now when demand is dropping, unavoidably they have to let people go. It's very hard step for them to do, but there's no other way around that. And they have to adapt to that challenge as well. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely a very interesting moment. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, it was kind of expected because, you know, some of these companies, they hired more personnel that they actually needed. Uh, mm -hmm. But now that there's lots of pressure because of interest rates, obviously stock, and particularly growth stocks, need to also uh, show uh, profitability, uh, particularly those that have never been profitable. Um, and then uh, obviously this sh shakes up a little bit the market. So hopefully it's not like back in the days in, in the 2000s with the dot com, but we get like a mild recession or something that can allow like, you know, like some sort of correction that naturally happens in this kind of industries, right? Exactly. Fingers crossed. It's not going to be, you know, 2000 all over again. Now, this September, you was uh, one of the speakers at a promotion summit, San Francisco 2022. And in your presentation, you brought up the seven step strategy to build a profitable growth monetization strategy for subscription apps. So I'd like to introduce this strategy to our audience. So let's t talk about the genesis of it the how it came about part of this let's say framework way of doing things uh, over the past 10 years and plus of my um, professional experiences like um my background as i mentioned is pretty much on pricing promotions revenue management so a little bit of this knowledge i got it from um working side by side with some consultants from simon kitchen and partners which is one of the leading pricing and revenue growth uh, companies, uh, consulting companies in the world. Um, so after that, uh, obviously, um, I'd say like most of these consulting firms are not very good at doing recommendations for tech companies, to be honest. Um, I wouldn't generalize, but it, this is my sense because when I was working at Uber, that we also like, had all, all the other opportunities with other big, big consulting firms. But I started doing my own, let's say, toolkit, right? Like this toolbox, uh, getting some of these learnings and kind of like shaping this in a way that uh, create a roadmap, a checklist or something that uh, like kind of provide insights to or document like best practice to other teams. So that's how I built this. Uh, it was also when I was, uh, we were launching uh, Uber Rewards, Uber Pass back at Uber. So we decided to do this as part of this strategy to replicate like a playbook. Um, mm -hmm. And then it was part of the knowledge knowledge that, that, that I built for, for, for the App Promotion Summit in San Francisco like this year. Got it. Okay, let's walk through the whole set of seven steps, starting with step number one, external assessment. What is this step is about? What's important to remember to do it right? Yeah, so, so to put in context, like this uh, framework, is, uh, it can be applied for obviously these companies or these apps that have a subscription model, subscription revenue model, and that they want to calibrate, adjust, or just launch a subscription model as part of another revenue stream, right? So the first step, uh, as, as you ask, is about doing an external validation or external assessment. And what this basically implies is making sure that your customers are perceiving your value proposition in a way that makes you identify these key success factors and which are relevant for them, but which are also relevant for other uh, competitors. So in an example, you may have some key success for uh, key successful factors, key success factors for like quality, brand, uh, performance, safety, or pricing of your own product, right? But then you need to uh, address this to your customer and then 
uh, uh, doing like surveys or focus groups or any other kind of like research mechanism that you want to put in place, then you're going to have this first analysis of like what's the point of view of a customer. And then you need to also ask the customer with these key success factors, how are they, they perceiving competition if they are actually using the products of competitors, right? So this is super important because it's going to help you create what I call this value map or this uh, matrix in which we identify with these different levers or with these different key success factors, how is my product right now positioned against competition? This is definitely the first step because it's going to give you the opportunity to identify how are you standing against not only your competitors, but your rivals. And, and this is important because in, a, in, in this economy of apps where the switching cost is so low, you're obviously going to have some substitutes that maybe are not your like front, forefront runner competitors, but maybe other ways or other means in which customers with other solutions can do the same that they are having with you. We live in a very dynamic world and the app industry mirrors its rapid changes. Your app growth depends on new knowledge and skills like never before. This December, one and only Berlin will open its doors for app marketers from all corners of the world. Go to appromotionsummit.com slash Berlin to register and be part of it. So this is the reality check. You're stepping out of your brand. Take a look from the outside and see how your brand, your app stack up with the rest, with the landscape of your competitors and see what is the perception of people who are using your product on a daily basis. Because we all know that there are kind of a two uh, kind of uh, competition for every app brand on the app store and then on the screen of a smartphone where people are sticking to the very small set of apps to use on a daily basis. And it's extremely important to know th their perception of your brand to be able to actually build a strategy based on data. And then the second step, um, it's, um, it's internal analysis. Uh, and this normally works best for companies that already have a subscription plan uh, or any sort of like pricing model that they want to revisit, right? So it's, it's important to understand this because like, um, you may find that most of these like uh, software as a service companies or those having these subscription models, they have these business models in which they want to be super clear, super transparent and super simple to their customers. So they normally design one package or maybe two or three pitches according to the function that they want to optimize. If this is something regarding, for instance, I don't know, use cases. So they will create like packages for that. So in this internal validation, what you need to address is basically if these packages are satisfying your profitable profitable goal needs, right? Uh, it's obviously going to be super difficult to have one subscription that, that fits all, uh, if not impossible. Um, but in the end, this analysis should be driven by the necessity of addressing if we actually need more subscription plans, if we actually need to calibrate the existing one to increase or reduce the pricing um, to do some like sort of like packaging. So this is something that we are seeing right now very often uh, with inflation, like the, like companies reducing the sizing of their own packages or finding other ways in which they can push promotions so that they don't they don't lose any sort of demand over time. So this internal validation is something that I'm seeing lots of companies are doing during these current inflationary times, uh, but it's part of this process, doing an external validation to see how are others seeing you, and then an internal validation to, to actually address if things are going in the direction, at least on the profitable side that you want. Okay, great. Step number three, conceptual packaging. Certainly, it's important to be thoughtful about what you include in your packages, uh, the offer to your users. So what a brand should do on this step? So it's basically understanding the balance between simplicity and flexibility. This is the, the most important takeaway here. Um, it's I've seen there I've seen lots of subscription apps and then other apps that might, might not need to have a, a subscription model as a main revenue driver, but they normally have also those subscription packages as a retention driver, right? But they normally uh, have flaws most of the times to, uh, to address uh, how should we design this package, right? So this is this is step number three is it's just about like building this first conceptual, and I'm going to say this conceptual because it's not something that you have already validated in the market. This is something that we're going to see further on in the next steps. 
but at least to have this brainstorming with your teams to identify if we're having this right balance between simplicity and flexibility. So for instance, we can see that companies like Amazon Prime, like, like Netflix, like Spotify, they do pretty much good balance between uh, doing packages that are very simple. They only have one option, two options, three options, like LinkedIn, for instance, they do that, like through three or, three or four options. Uh, or if we go to other uh, subscription economy uh, businesses, for instance, insurance or health, that they have what we call a little bit like a la carte uh, or design your own focused uh, um, uh, pricing model or subscription model, right? Uh, the more simple, obviously, it's for a customer like a uh, game changer. Uh, but at the end, uh, the simplest that you make it, also you can leave lots of money on the table, right? So it has to be with the sort of like business you are. I recommend for business to, cost to customers or to consumer companies, like Netflix, like Verizon, like Salesforce, uh, in a way to do like very simple packages. Uh, and for others that require a little bit more scrutiny to do like more of this conceptual packages that require the customer to interact more, to design their own subscription plan as they want. Uh, and then and, th and then obviously step three, the, the most important outcome here is just to have this conceptual package because it's the one that you're gonna go and test in the market before launching. All right. And speaking of Netflix, I'm very interested interested to see how their ad supported plan is going to be made by the end users in the long run. Because uh, for me, it was a bit an expected an expected step on their side. Uh, because obviously, we knew that Netflix was completely ad free business for years. You were just paying for your subscription. Now they're introducing this ad supported plan, and I'm kind of both minds. <laughs> No, I'm not sure if it's great or um, if it's a good step or not. Well, so it, re it remains to be seen. It's it's going to be very interesting. Um, they're launching this uh, new package in a very interesting time where like, they also have the risk of those customers that they were already the low tier pricing to move towards the ads uh, mm -hmm. the model. That's risky. And uh, they obviously have to have like lots of simulations and analysis and and. and, and a lot of uh, internal validation, as I mentioned, for the step two. But time will tell. I mean, the thing is that we already have like other pricing models, like the one that Hulu has, and that have proved to be profitable. But at the end mm -hmm. of the day, if you give customers access to this model and then they love it or it's not a problem for them, then it can change dramatically your financials. So it has to be a an, an step in which they need to look this closely. Let's see how, how it goes. We'll see, absolutely. Okay, next step, monetization goals. It is a strategic one. So how should a brand set monetization goals to build a sustainable business? You know what? This is the step that I actually put here on this framework as a step four because I was asking myself the other day, uh, uh, it's like there are so many companies that don't have, they always like obviously short-term cited in terms of like seeing what's the best for the company within the next 12 months or so but mm -hmm. if you don't create your subscription pricing or the model or any kind of revenue model that you're trying to change to optimize profits or profitable growth of the company if you will um it's about like identifying if this subscription will be designed eventually to cover all the other product releases that you may have in the future, right? Because mm -hmm. what we are seeing so far is like we, we're seeing lots of companies that they do their pricing or they do their, their long-term subscription plan. And then a few years after when they have another vertical or another adjacency of their own core business, um, they they figured out that it's difficult to, to move customers from their top of mind to have now a secondary, a third subscription plan. So I think this is important to, to have a little bit of outlook of how this is going to help improve uh, three functions that are important for any company. The first one at least is like deep selling. So making customers to increase their repurchase frequency within the same product category. The second mm -hmm. one is increasing upselling, which is let's say within the, within the same, let's say business unit, more products, particularly the more the, the, the ones are uh, a little bit more pricey. And then the cross-selling, which is going to other business units that you may have eventually in your business. Uh, the more that you see your business in this platformized way, if we call it that way, uh, the more uh, successful this uh, subscription will be, uh, considering that other players are also moving into different directions. So I think the most important 
outcome of this is step number four is is to address that your uh, goals need to be aligned to how you envision your 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 business, and then this package that you're going to design it needs to also be uh, in a way designed for eventually including or incorporating benefits from other products that you may have. All right, so moving to the next step: pricing structure and simulation. So. What are the models to choose from and what mistakes people should avoid it to build um, efficient pricing structure? How exactly a simulation for a pricing model can be run? Yeah, I, mean, I think this step is the most, most difficult one for companies, particularly if they don't involve people from finance, people from operations, people from marketing to pick the right pricing model. Um, it, I wouldn't say that there's like a recipe for, okay, let's say that there, for instance, like many, many models, right? Like the flat rate model uh, in which you have one pricing, it doesn't matter how much uh, usage you have from the features that you're providing or the benefits that you're providing. There are other ones about like pay as you go, obviously, other ones that have a, a hybrid model in which you uh, have something uh, as part of the package and then you have something capped by pay or by usage or something. Um, but the most important part here is understanding that some of these pricing models are very familiar uh, according to the industry and according to what the expectations or the or the or the financials of the company are. So eventually, if your company relies a lot on variable costs, so let's say for instance Uber, Uber relies a lot on the variable costs, you may not need to have a flat rate pricing model. You might need to have something that goes perhaps as pay as you go or my two, two, the, let's say two dimensions in which you have a hybrid model. So it's very important that part because if you design a pricing model in which you give everything to the customer, all the benefits or all the usage and you don't put caps or you don't address that in a way that gives you some sort of like flexibility, you may, you may actually make the biggest mistake of your company by uh, bringing lots of bringing lots of customers that might find your product very attractive price wise, but then on the financials and the P and L you may have lots of losses. So this is very important, and uh, that's why uh, on the next steps I suggest simulations. But uh, we can debug. I mean, like a few hours about this. But the most important takeaway is just right. making sure what business model you have. And I think one interesting uh, takeaway here is just to just. Just by changing the pricing model makes a difference. So we can say we can say, for instance, like the YouTube model that we have so far, or the OnlyFans model. So the OnlyFans model, the only thing that they actually did is changing the pricing model, and, and you you know it's been super successful for content creators. So I think this is most difficult part, but if 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 it works, it can make a big difference for your company. Right, and the, obviously every business is trying to build the sustainable. Uh, business to last for months, for years uh, down the road. And you're a part of the economy. And unfortunately, you cannot predict what's coming up for the economy for the next year, for the next quarter and so forth. And so we have to basically adjust your pricing model or business model in some fashion to the economy, to the current economic conditions that may change unpredictable for you. You, you may start with one model and then you have to consider something else when you see that uh, because of your scale, probably it's not relevant when you're a small company, but when you're going to the big scale, it may be really relevant to you how many um, how many money people are actually willing to spend on a monthly basis. Do, do they want to pay for um, uh, to Apple, to Netflix, to who, to Paramount Plus uh, and so forth? Like, well, what is the balance like? Um, how do you actually win this game, this <laughs> this game of subscriptions, so to speak? I think the first important part to understand is that most customers don't. I mean, particularly young people uh, don't like, like to have lots of subscriptions. They uh, there's lots of research about this. Even I can validate this from working at my current company and when, when I was working at Uber. Normally, most Americans, for instance, and, and, uh, and it also varies per region, right? I'm talking right now about like the U.S. and Canada, but they mm -hmm. like to have four or five subscriptions the most. Um, so it it all goes into now the share of wallet or how much money they have for, for paying these uh, subscriptions. So it's no coincidence that some of these customers are changing from streaming uh, 
uh, as long as they have a new series that they like, right? Or, or the one that they don't, they have finished and then they canceled. So the pricing point normally goes between like 10, 10 bucks or $10 uh, uh, per month towards like 25 for something. But it, it depends a lot on the benefits. It depends a lot about the proposition of that. But, it, but that's pretty much uh, an outlook of how things look like so far. So when you're designing a new subscription, you need to make sure uh, who you are also competing with. That's what I was mentioning in, in point number one, your rivals, your substitutes, or other ones that are at the end getting the attention or going after the attention of your customer or most importantly, the money. All right. Uh, now, experimentation and rollout, the next step. What are the tactics to run experimentation to validate subscription models? Most important is like step step five and step six is uh, obviously first learn lots of simulations uh, and, and for this is super important i not it's pr probably not worth to do like a super lots of deep dives but the more simulations that you do that you make sure that your 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 uh, subscription model will be profitable eventually or even event or even profitable at the just at the time that it's launched is the best but um, on step six is doing is just to start launching the testing and there are many techniques uh, some of the ones that we saw at the Apple motion summit the most obviously obvious ones or the most choose ones are a b testing but there are many other ones uh, we also talk about monte carlo simulation i love the market insights uh, tools like the content study or like the bank western double gable branch surveys because that gives you an idea also the price point that you want to charge um but obviously on the experimentation front and uh, there are many other ones uh, some other ones require a little bit more of like data science but for me it's important at the end of the day to have always in, always in mind that that before launch a product super important to include these teams that are um, that are responsible for monetization uh, and then to have this vision about experimentation in which they use data to test even if it's an AB testing that works before going like with a massive rollout but also have this like what, what I call the creative side of things which is doing like surveys doing focus groups and getting what perception tells you about customers because obviously the data can tell you something but perception of a, about how customers are seeing the world might be counterintuitive if you if you if you will and then at the end of the day the the in-house expertise right if you have people that have been in the industry for i don't know like 10 12 years or something obviously it's super important to understand uh, or to have a, an input from their point of view because sometimes that can make the difference, particularly if you have not foreseen some some trends that ha can change it the way that you're doing things. So in this last step is basically uh, using these methods and, and test your product in the market with a few cohorts and then be prepared to, to the most important part, which is rolling out. And the very final step, number seven, feed loop, feedback loops. Uh, sorry, uh, a successful business is a marathon. So obviously all step, steps we've just laid out cannot be just performed once. So what are the right mindset for doing these loops? Super important to, to have this as part of the culture of the company, to always design products that are uh, in a way addressing uh, the reasons why customers are canceling their membership, for instance, the reasons why customers are moving towards other uh, rivals or competitors. Uh, just to always have this view of having constant uh, feedback loops in a way of focus groups, in a way of surveys, in a way of any sort of like uh, internal or external validation, as, as we mentioned before, and then mm -hmm. offer solutions to customers. If these solutions is like, okay, you stay with me and I give you, I don't know, like 10% off, 20% off, just try to use data to to identify these cohorts that are about to churn. Uh, those cohorts are very satisfied that you need, might not need to give them any promotions to retain them uh, and to, let's say, commoditize the value, your valuable position. Super important to address this in the most important way, asking customers for feedback and then translating this feedback into product features, into um, go-to-market strategies that are definitely a way, an innovative way to, to go after the new, let's say, latent needs that these customers may have and you've got a seven step strategy uh how to build the growth strategy for your app subscription app and do it successfully and uh, build a sustainable business now alex he, you've been in mobile tech for years i bet there's something about the industry you would really like to change if there's anything like that 
Uh, yes, I think uh, there's need to be more focus about monetization. Um, I've seen lots of business models that they they have raised and they continue raising lots of money. Some ideas that are super disruptive, some other ones that time will tell if they are actually proving that are in the right timing because at the end of the day, the timing is what matters the most in most of these uh, industries. Um, so I think uh, VCs, uh, entrepreneurs, like uh, um, even the, the own employees on these companies need to start question more whether the business model will be profitable. Uh, we need to see that these uh, innovative products uh, sometimes might not be a, a necessity or, or something that is highly demanded for customers. Uh, some other ones might be more like nice to have. And, and I think these inflationary times will definitely um, define some startups that will continue afterwards and some other ones that might need to revisit their business model, some other ones that sadly will need to shut down. Uh, uh, but in the end of the day, my biggest recommendation is to start seeing more or to include more monetization topics into any innovative innovation process that you may have in your company. Um, the more that we start doing this, the more we're gonna see so why some other companies are so successful that they might not continue doing the Delta store, the break up, break things uh, very fast strategy as we saw with Facebook and many other companies in the past, but more into how we can build a business that is sustainable over time. I think that's the most important takeaway. Okay, switching the gears. Um, there's a second part in the show where I'm asking just a few quick questions because there's only um, there's an only uh, one goal for the show to bring up a topic and educate our audience. But I want to give a chance to every guest on the show to talk about her, herself and himself and let the people know them a little bit better. So. What smartphone do you have now? Uh, have you been switching between these two giants or staying one side? Funny question. I've always had like iOS. So yeah, I've never tested Android. I've, I've done some testing with internal product features that I have, but as an external phone, but personally and professionally, I've always had like an iPhone. So yeah. Oh, pre-2007 era, before two giants emerged, uh, what was your mobile phone, uh, flip phone back then? It was actually the very first iPhone back in the day. So I, I would say like an app, I'm super Apple fan. Uh, all, everything that is on the ecosystem works for me. Uh, so yeah, that was that was the first, it was back in 2007, actually. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, it's been a, it's, it's been a while. So um, funny question right now, if you left your home uh, without your smartphone in your pocket, what would be the most missing, missing feature for you? Communication. I think definitely that's the, the one that makes me more anxious. Uh, actually, I found over an over two of things. I definitely uh, couldn't like find that or be in contact with some of the the people. That, so I think in these days, communication is super important. Like if you ask me for, for the most important app that I have, it's always the top or uh, if. That I don't have a big empty space in my soul. So yeah. Got it. So uh what new app technologies are you most excited about? Um software, hardware, uh something that it's not trendy, not being covered a lot, but for you personally, uh what would what what would you like your smartphone being capable to do that it's not capable of doing right now? Super interesting question. I think short term is everything about personal, how companies are going to be facing the cookie list, cookie less uh, environment. Uh, how are they going to be able to achieve the same results with advertising uh, in an in a in a world with uh, Android and iOS are having such restrictions that we're seeing so far. And then I think uh, mid to long term, everything that we're everyone's talking about about the metaverse, about these new use cases of chain NFT. See if this was actually a hint, or if there are like important use cases that we can use within the next few years. But uh, I think this is the new technologies that are going to change the way that we interact with others. That are going to definitely define how we're going to start monetizing differently, if it's going to be, continue to be more centralized in a relationship with a company, or it's going to be more decentralized, as these new models suggest. I still have some doubt, doubts, but I think 
uh, as, with any innovation. You need to to wait for the right timing and obviously to mm -hmm. wait for the right amount of investment to do that. You know, in a in a in a let's say in a way that is relatively uh, fast for for the market to change. Yeah, gotcha. sure. And the refining question before I let you go, uh, how can people get in touch with you and get more information about what you do? So I think the most important was on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, I think I, I, I don't use Twitter, um, but I think the most important, uh, let's say, way to, to reach out to me is on LinkedIn. Um, I can give you my details further around so, so you can add to the Posca down there. But, uh, but yeah, I think I'm always responsive, super responsive, always uh, uh, glad to chat with other uh, brilliant mindsets and obviously uh, giving me the opportunity to to share some of the knowledge that I have acquired over the past few years. So, yeah. Terrific. Alex, thank you so much for your time and coming on our show. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. You too. And that was Alex Guerra, head of monetization at Best Super App. To listen to more episodes, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, to search for business of apps and you will find us easily. Remember, we release episodes on Mondays, so subscribe and you will be able to get new episodes on your smartphone, tablet, or computer as soon as we release them. And please don't forget to leave us a review or comment on iTunes. It is highly appreciated. And all episodes will also be available on businessofapps.com. Thank you for listening. See you next week. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com. Thank you.